Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dyslexia Life Hacks Show. I'm your host, Matthew Head. And in this episode, I'm talking to Kate Ferranzi. She's the founder and CEO of Redwood Literacy. Founded in 2018, Redwood Literacy offer research-based reading, writing, and maths interventions at an accessible price point for people from diverse social economic backgrounds. As always, I'll put links to Redwood Literacy and other things we talk about, which will be in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexianlifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thank you. So it's great having you here, and you're all the way over from Chicago. Um, obviously, you're not living there at the moment, but that's, I get the impression that's where you grew up. So I'd be really interested to start this podcast off with what it was like growing up and going to school in Chicago. Well, actually, I grew up in Eastern Europe in Albania, oh, and wow. my parents were there for their job. So I spent uh, from age five to 15, I got to experience uh, mostly life in Albania and also traveling all over Europe, uh, which was a very unique experience and one that I think added quite a bit to my educational journey as well as my professional career. Um, but I, I was in the Chicago area then from age 15 on. That's where I got my undergraduate degree. Um, I got certified as a specialist in working with neurodivergent children in the U.S. is called a learning behavior specialist degree. Um, and uh, taught, taught, I am also actually a, a high school dropout. So I did not finish all of my own high school experience, but had a bit of a non-traditional route uh, partially because I was in and out of a lot of schools growing up um, and also just uh, was was kind of ready for the next step. I knew what I wanted to do. And so I started community college at the age of 16 and uh, have been working with kids ever since. And dyslexia came. I do not have dyslexia myself, but my dyslexia kind of came into my life um, in the sense of I was aware of it very early on in my teaching career, I, because I started meeting these older students in, you know, ages 12, 13, 14 years old. And I knew that they had the intelligence to be able to learn how to read and write proficiently, but I saw them really struggling and I didn't know how to help them. So that led me on a whole journey of learning about dyslexia, how prevalent it is, um, and what kinds of instruction and supports are available to support the dyslexic brain so that it can be set up for success to do all the amazing things that it can do. Yes, yes. And it sounds like, obviously, in childhood, you moved around a lot of schools, so you must have experienced a lot of different learning styles. If you started in Europe and worked your way through back to the States, then... <laughs> How are you? How did you find all the different experiences? And would that have knocked on to how, what your opinion and dropping out of school at a young age at that point? Yeah, I think it showed me that there are a lot of different routes to learning and that it does not have to look one way. Um, there's many successful ways. There's there's lots of different pathways to success, whatever, you know, I mean, even the word success, how do we define it, right? But if I'm Finding success as somebody uh, be living their life in alignment with who they are as a person and finding joy and meaning in their work. Um, for me, that's how I identify, you know, one of the ways I identify success. I think that I was able to see that there are more, there's more than one pathway to finding that. And I think that served me very well individually in my own educational and professional journey. Um, you know, the, the role that I play now, really my full-time job is running a business. Um, and I don't have any formal business training, but I think my, my ability to see that there's, you know, multiple ways to achieve something. And it's not always the one educational route that maybe is a little bit more rigid or a little bit more black and white. So I've seen, I've seen that really benefit myself in my personal life and professional life. And also I think it's made me think about the education of uh, neurodivergent brains or specifically for this conversation, the dyslexic brain with a much open, more open mind. I think that I have, there's a, there, I feel like we have so much room to build an educational pathway or a, a successful professional pathway for an individual with dyslexia by thinking outside the box and learning from maybe uh, others who do things differently than how our society says it must be done. Yes, yes. And <laughs> what drew you to education then? Because you said you dropped out and had your own plan, but what was it like? Actually, I want to go back into the education thing. Considering you left 
education earlier yourself? <laughs> what was the kind of spark for that? Well, I left, I left the education. I, I never stopped learning and I never stopped actually being in school. I just did it in a non-traditional way and kind of in a different order than, than common in the States. Um, I started, I, when I first started community college, I w- thought I wanted to be an engineer. And so I did one year of engineering school and loved, loved all of it, except that I started to realize how much I enjoy working with people. And I think I started to wonder, is this going to be a career that is not going to give me as much interaction with people as I want? Um, Around that same time, this is when I was 17 years old, so still very young. I also got involved. um, I started a community outreach program in in the small town that I was living in, in rural Illinois, which is the, the state that Chicago is in, in the U.S. And it was a program kind of like a mentoring program for uh, kids that lived in a certain neighborhood close to where I lived. And so that started happening when I was 17 and I found so much joy and energy in working, you know, alongside those young people, you know, learning from them and also teaching them what I knew about being a human and trying to navigate, you know, the school system and make sure they had access to the resources that they were entitled to by law. And so I, that kind of that advocacy process and that, that non-traditional, but very much an educational space showed me how much joy I got out of that work. And so when I was 17, I switched my, my major in college um, and started studying to be a teacher. And about a year into that process, I realized I want to work with students who who are non-traditional, who don't fit into kind of the, 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 you know, the structure that our school is set up around. Um, and that's, so I've been, I mean, pretty actively involved in that space since I was 18. So coming up on 20 years, which is hard to believe. Oh, blimey. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Did you have any inkling of, um, in your words, the sort of non-traditional children beforehand when you would, through your own school experience, before you ended up sort of meeting them in the sort of, she was saying in a professional sense that you're learning to be a teacher and then working as well. Was there ever an inkling before that, hang on, why does certain kids go off to here or why are they struggling? Maybe other people aren't. Was there any of that going on? Um, a little bit. I think in Albania specifically, there the and, and it might be different now. I have not been back to Albania for 15 years, so um, I can't really speak to what it's like now. But when I yeah. was there and as a part of that school system, there was really no – education for students that learn differently. If you had any sort of learning disability or cognitive impairment or even physical impairment, oftentimes that meant that you just didn't go to school, uh, which obviously has huge implications on your future. And so I... As a small child, you know, I grew up in that environment and had many of my friends uh, that I would play with, you know, outside after school didn't go to school because they, you know, were considered they had one of these things going on. And so I think that really impacted me at a young age. I felt like that was unfair. Um, I remember getting, you know, feeling angry and asking my parents questions. This isn't fair. Why can't they go to school, too? Um <sighs> And then through through my teenage years, and especially that program when I was 18, many of those students were struggling in school and uh, were really struggling to be successful in that environment. But I was getting to know them outside of that environment, and I was able to see their intelligence and their capacity. And so I think that disconnect of, wait a minute, there's I know you can do learn how to do these things. I see your capacity here, but when you're in this environment, you tend to shut down and not find the success that I know is there for you. How how might I be a part of helping connect, you know, kind of close that that gap for those students? Yes, yes. <laughs> what were you doing in sort of the initial phases? You obviously identified these students as, you're saying like flashbacking into when you're in Albania and then during your sort of teacher training, but what was your... What was the first methodology you maybe did some research and you're like, ah, I'm going to give this thing a go? Or were you purely sort of trialing and error by stuff you could make up while you were going along? Yes. Uh, Thank God that it was not all trial and error. So 
I, when I got to, I graduated from university when I was 21 and started teaching full time. Um, I taught one year in rural Illinois in a small town and then moved up to Chicago one year later. So the majority of my teaching career was in Chicago. And I, you know, very early on in those first couple of years, I had, I taught middle school and high school, which in, in the U.S. is ages 11 to 18. And so these are older students um, and almost all of the students that were put in my classroom were students that that could not yet read or write proficiently. And that's why they were put in my classroom, because I was that teacher who was there to help the students that were struggling. And so very early on in my career, I saw that I was going to need some more tools in my tool belt because I saw the students. And so I found, I started researching and found the Wilson Reading System, which is a curriculum designed by Wilson Language, which is an organization here in the U.S. They've been around for over 30 years, um, are very well respected in the U.S. as one of the top reading programs for students with dyslexia. And so I... I found, I heard about them, actually, my mom, I was talking to her on the phone, you know, describing my students to her. And she was like, have you ever heard of the Wilson Reading System? And so I started researching them and immediately went to one of their workshops and got certified at the, at the, you know, went through their year long training program and started implementing their method with my students in my Chicago classroom. And immediately, you know, well, I shouldn't say immediately within three months, Students, you know, 12 year old, 13, 14 year olds who had gone their whole school career without being able to read were starting to learn how to read. And so I was immediately bought in that yeah. this is what I wanted to do. I, I had found a tool that worked and I had and I, I wanted to work with students who uh, give that give students access to that methodology, especially students who otherwise wouldn't have access. Yes, yes. Uh, can you tell me a bit more about the Wilson reading system, sort of some of its methodology and how it sort of helps dyslexic people learn how to read? Yes, I would love to. So the Wilson reading system is a structured literacy intervention program designed for students who are struggling the most. In the U.S., we call that tier three, uh, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three. So tier three students are students who usually are below the 20th percentile in their reading and writing skills. Um, so kind of that bottom tier of uh, when you look at performance through that lens. And it is it, it's comprised of explicit instruction that has um, immediate error correction and is aligned with a scope and sequence of skills that build on each other. So I, you know, describe it as like a ladder. You you teach students how to climb to the first rung, and then we go step by step, and we keep climbing and climbing and climbing until they build all the skills that they need to feel confident with their reading and writing. Um, and what I mean by explicit instruction is. Wilson has taken through research and research frameworks and evidence-based studies they've taken, and they're they're not the only ones who have done this, but they are the ones that introduced me to this. They've taken, you know, something as large as learning how to read, which in some ways is very vague, and they've broken it into very explicit steps that you, you know, concrete skills that you can teach a student how to do. Um, So that explicit instruction, immediate error correction, aligned with a clear scope and sequence of skills, and, you know, with a lot of teacher coaching and training. So their certification process is a year, like I mentioned, it's requires online coursework, you read a lot of research, you dig deep into the science behind why you're doing each part of the lesson the way that they're telling you to do it, not just, hey, do one, two, three, but this is why, and this is why it works, and this is what you do when it doesn't work. Um, and so so that initial, the online coursework, and then you also work with a student one-on-one and are observed by a coach and have to pass, you know, they have a very rigorous set of requirements. I did not pass within my I had five observations and needed to do an additional observation because I hadn't yet mastered all the level, all the parts of the lesson. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that intensive teacher training and then ongoing coaching and support, I think, is also a really crucial piece of the puzzle. Because what I've found with working with individuals with dyslexia, and also my husband is dyslexic, my daughter is dyslexic, so now it's okay. Yeah, more than just my professional life. 
But I have found that it's, you know, teaching a dyslexic brain. And again, dyslexia is on a spectrum. So every, it's, you know, every student's a little bit different, but it requires what I have found is that dyslexic students can totally learn how to read and write um, and kind of access the education or the content at their cognitive level that they can access through explicit instruction that is delivered patiently and with a lot of creativity and growing expertise on the side of the instructor. So it's not a one size fits all, even within the world of dyslexic students, Mm -hmm. you you still can't just take one methodology and be like, this should work for everybody. I, at least I have found that, you know, and I've worked with thousands of students at this point in my career, dyslexic students specifically, I have found that having a, a many tools in your tool belt as a dyslexia specialist and also that thought partnership amongst other dyslexia specialists to really be able to respond to how each student is responding to the intervention you're giving is, is just crucial in order to really help them that student reach their goals. Yes, yes. And um, after you complete that methodology, how long did you stay uh, working in other schools before sort of setting up your own business? And did you start employing other techniques as alongside it and growing your kind of tool belt as you call it? Yeah. So I was in, I taught in the public school system and then in a, in the charter school system uh, for five years before I started a private practice. I started having my own kids, my own babies. And so I wanted to work less hours Um, So five years in kind of the formal school system. And then I started doing private practice where I would go to people's homes or we would meet at a library and I would deliver dyslexia therapy one-to-one with students. And I did that for four years. And I really loved that work. Um, I kind of, the reason that my husband and I co-founded Redwood was that we saw the discrepancy between the the schools that we taught in through the public education system were mostly in neighborhoods where there were much less resources. And so we saw students who have learning disabilities in a neighborhood or a school uh, environment that does not have a lot of resources, it is much more difficult for them to get access to the intervention that they need to be set up for success. And then in our private practice, we saw families who had the financial resources and had the education, the, you know, the awareness to to figure out my child has dyslexia, because at least in the U.S., that is not an easy process. I don't know in the U.K. if it's a little bit easier to get that dyslexic diagnosis. But in the States, it's actually very difficult for families. It's expensive. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of advocacy and persistence on the parent's part. And so the in our private practice, we saw that we were working with students who had all the resources. And it, it was amazing work. We loved working with those students and their families. Uh, but the reason we, we moved towards starting our own actual business where we had a storefront and now that has grown into many programs is we wanted to offer the best in class intervention for dyslexic learners, but to students who otherwise wouldn't have access, right? To students who didn't necessarily maybe have as, as much connection or access to these special resources. Um, and, and that's kind of the journey that we've been on then since 2018. So, so peeling the cover back a bit, obviously you, you already mentioned the access to diagnosis and I assume well-funded schools have more teaching resource. But apart from those sort of two reasonably obvious things, I guess, what other things would a well-funded school do differently to a say, lesser funded school. How does that look different outside of teacher and diagnosis help? So um, I don't, I, th- I think funding is part of it. I think a lot of it is awareness, the right, right awareness. And so if you have, you know, in more affluent communities, you frequently have, um, you know, a much more parent guardian involvement in the child's education because there's more room for that, right? If our basic needs are met, if my bills are paid, and if I have what I need, then I have more mental capacity to say, okay, I'm not just going to blindly trust my child's school to give them a fair education. I'm going to like ask questions and dig deeper and find out what are my rights by law. Um, and I'm experiencing that now as a parent. I, I, my child, my daughter who's dyslexic, she's in, she's seven years old. So she's young, but she goes to a public school in our neighborhood and it's a very well-funded school. It's a very, you know, the community we live in is well-resourced 
And yet I've had to advocate pretty consistently to get my daughter what she needs because there's just a lack of awareness on what is dyslexia? What is it not? You know, um, there's a lot of misunderstanding or misconception about dyslexia. And even in the education space, I think we would hope or expect that everyone knows, but they just don't. And I've, you know, I've at this point in my career, I believe that dyslexia education is pretty specialized. You know, just like in the medical field, we don't expect a general practitioner doctor to be able to perform heart surgery or to, you know, to be able to do ortho, you know, if you break your bone to, to you know, there's specialists for, for various areas. And I think in the education space, when you're, especially when you're talking about neurodivergent learners who don't, again, quote unquote, fit as easily into the structure that we have set up, um, I think it does require, you know, specialist knowledge and then not just the knowledge, but that advocacy to help educate and help, uh, you know, clarify and clear up misunderstanding so that students really are getting what they need to be set up for success. Yes, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's not just the nuts and bolts of the school and the school system, but the the whole society is built around it. And having not grown up in states, I, I don't know how the system works, whether you get like big pockets of certain types of people from socioeconomic backgrounds all live in the same area and then all feed in the same school, and then the other pockets the other way around, so you get a lot of that. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, no, and of course the whole—it's the whole mix, isn't it? it? You couldn't just lift one school and swap it with the other one and get the, get the same results because of the whole social structure that's built around it, and having parents that are clued up and switched on to the other, as you say, with your own daughter, push things forwards. Yes, yes, exactly. So obviously, that is the spark behind Redwood Literacy, and you and your husband started it, but. At what point did you feel, I don't know whether the word frustrated would be the correct one, with what you were doing in terms of being employed and thought, I really need to set something up? Was there any particular catalyst for that that really got you sort of going into, let's make a thing of this? Yeah, that's a great, that's a fun question. Um, yes, I wasn't dissatisfied. I loved teaching in the school system and and some days I miss it. You know, there's something that's really uh, special about teaching in a school, like a traditional neighborhood public school. Um, I have very fond memories. It was, it, I couldn't have done what I've done at Redwood without that experience. I think it yeah. taught me so much about um, education, educational systems, what works, what doesn't work. How do you respond when something doesn't work? Um, so it was not like, oh my God, I can't wait to get out of this place at all. It was, <laughs> I really enjoyed my time as in, in both the public system and then the charter system. Really, I only stepped out of the classroom full time because I had young kids myself. And um, it, especially because we lived a little bit far further away from the school. We, we My husband and I taught at the same schools, both mm -hmm. in the public sector and then in the charter sector. So the commute and just kind of more quality of life, um, wanting to to be home with my own kids, but I didn't want to stop working. So I stepped out of the classroom full time, full time, and then right away started working with a few students on the side. And I think I originally viewed that as a short term season, just while my children were very young until they were ready to go to school. And then I imagined myself going back to the classroom. Yes. Uh, but then Redwood really was born so I think number one, we were tired. My husband and I were tired of commuting all over the city to go to people's homes. And so as our family was growing, we were looking how, how might we re reduce the amount of hours we're away from our own kids, but still, you know, make our living doing this and offer high quality service. So that was one reason. And then I think the second reason was again, what I mentioned, just seeing that disconnect between, wait a minute, this specialty that now we have built within ourselves, you know, both my husband and I are dyslexia specialists, is we're not able to give it to the students that originally drew us into education, which is students who don't have as many resources, who have extra barriers set up against them. And we missed that. That was a big part of why we had gone into education. And I think just having kind of the two extreme experiences, seeing working in very under-resourced schools and then working with very affluent families 
we just saw how wide that gap was and it doesn't, it didn't feel right. It didn't, you know, it doesn't feel, it feels like a gap that I I understand does not have simple answers. And we have, we Mm. have learned so many hard lessons at Redwood made so many mistakes and, you know, our attempts to do good. But I think that regardless of how difficult it is and how messy the process is, you know, I'm a firm believer that when we see injustice in our society, it's our responsibility to respond as we're able to. And this was, you know, we have this expertise, we have these skills. How could we use, how could we get these skills to the students who, who maybe need it most? Not, again, not that working with students who are less resources more important or more meaningful than working with students who have the resources. All we want is that everyone does have the resources. Yes. <laughs> But it, you know, it, it felt like a space where there wasn't enough of the service. And so I think that was the other big, and, and we wanted to, you know, I think the appeal of being able to work outside of the red tape and really just do what was best, what we thought was best for kids and not have to get it approved by five people and, you know, work within these parameters, I think was also a draw, especially in education of individuals with dyslexia because you've got to be able to have creativity and flexibility to to respond yeah. to needs. So what did it look like in his early days? It was must have been you and your husband. Because you know quite now it's got a lot of employees and is a fair size. But in the early days, was it just the two of you doing online courses and driving around the state to do one to one tuition? We, yeah, so the first year that Redwood was founded in 2018, we rented a storefront that was a five minute walk from our house. So okay. it was very sustainable to our life. Um, and we hired a full time nanny to help with our kids. And we hired one other assi- part time teacher and, and an instructional assistant. So there were four of us my husband and I, one other part time teacher, and then an assist, an instructional assistant. And we, you know, very grassroots. Again, we ha- we started it with ten thousand uh, dollars, so not very much money. Um, and it was a lot of, you know, just calling schools around the city, letting them know that we were opening this center. We had a we had a guideline from the beginning uh, that we wanted to have a 50-50 model, where about fifty percent of our clients paid full price, kind of market price for our mm. services. Okay. Uh, And then 50% of our clients were able to access the services for either free or at a reduced cost. And we, you know, had a business model to support that. And primarily we we were able to support that business model through small group instruction. So instead of doing one-to-one, we would group kids, put three to four kids in a group where, you know, similar ages as well as similar instructional levels. And we found that to be one way cheaper for families uh, we we could we could make it work on our end. We could pay for the storefront, pay our employees well, get good people, pay ourselves, um, and and we also saw now now six and a half almost seven years in, we've actually seen that students who work in small groups make just as much progress, if not more progress, as students who work individually. Uh, so that was a big part of this from the get go. Was if we're going to get this best in class instruction to students who otherwise wouldn't have access to it, we have to figure out how to be able to make it cheaper without reducing the quality of the instruction. And, and that was really through that small group instruction. So, you know, it was long days. We would, uh, you know, eat breakfast with our kids and then walk over at about 730 in the morning and we'd see students in the morning before they went to school. We had 10 students the first year that were actually with us all day in that storefront. We were their school, uh, kind of their school provider. Uh, and then we would see school or see students after school in the evening. Um, and it, you know, it was a, it would, they were long hours and long days for that first year to just kind of get, get enough, you know, get things up and running, learn how to run a business, learn how to get clients, learn how to get the word out. Um, but like you said, it has just really since that first year, it has just snowballed. And we've, you know, we're, we're actually, we're having to really start to say no to some opportunities because we've grown so quickly, which is, it has pros and cons. It's a beautiful thing. I think in, you know, so many ways we found that this is a really needed service and it's really helpful to families and to students. Um, it's, you know, we, we have teachers who work with us all over the United States. We have an amazing team of interventionists. 
So a lot of good things and also growing quickly means that it's, you know, it can be pretty stressful and you can make mistakes along the way because you're, you're moving fast. And so the, those early years were really special and, and have, you know, from those have come more than we would have ever imagined, which has been a really beautiful adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And how do you manage the 50, 50 model without giving away all the trade secrets, but you obviously the well-off people that are paying full price. So how do you manage the scale of it? And how do you manage people's expectations? Because they're going to be in a group where people are getting the same learning for different prices. So how, how does that all work? <laughs> oh, great question. I mean, we keep figuring it out every day. It's, <laughs> it's definitely not simple, um, but I would say it's doable. And I think it's important that it's doable because, again, if we don't figure out how to bridge that gap without reducing quality, which oftentimes when something is free, it's, you know, even if you have very well-intentioned volunteers who are tutoring the students, if they don't have the training, if they don't have the right curriculum, sometimes it can literally not make any academic difference for that child. And so, so we wanted to... We wanted it to be a business where we could pay teachers well, so we get high, highly qualified people. People will stay. You know, we have a lot of instructors who have been with us since the beginning, and we've also had a lot come and go. But it's, I think, overall, it's you know, we really prioritize teachers at the organization because they are the heartbeat of it all. And so, making trying to make it be a wonderful place to work and and a place that's sustainable because I think at least in the U.S in the field of education, it's often very long hours and very low pay. And so you just, you lose all the good people because they go off to do something that's more sustainable for their family. So we wanted it to be a place where teachers were paid well, very respected, you know, and, and, and elevated. Um, so I think that's been part of what's made it work. We're, we try to be very transparent with clients so that there are no surprises and we don't always get that right. I'm always learning about communication and how to be more clear, but we transparency is one of our core values. And so we, we want to make sure that families know, hey, this is the kind of place that Redwood is. You know, you're uh, through this collective group of people choosing to partner in this way, we're able to get this intervention to kids who otherwise wouldn't be able to get it. And that's really cool. And that's because of everybody's contribution to this community. Um, and on the same, you know, in the same breath, making sure that we are offering the best service. Because if we're, you know, if we're saying, if we're not off, if we're, if we're not providing a good service or an effective service for these families, and then we also have this payment model, that's, that's a slippery slope. We want yeah, all, yeah. no matter how much they're paying, we want all of Redwood students and families. And we also partner with many schools. So the schools we work with as well to feel like we say, every client is VIP. So it's like every client we want to try to give that individualized care to, hear what's important to them, build a relationship. Um, so I think that the culture that we've built, and again, we don't always get it perfectly. That's impossible. But I think we have a very healthy culture where we respect each other's differences where and where we really value collaboration and clear communication. Um, and that has been one of the crucial components that I think has made it work. And then we're also now that we're in year seven, now a big, you know, I, I taught in the programming through year four. And then the last two years, I've just been, you know, in a management growth development role. And really now my role now, because I have a, an amazing director team that really runs the programming my primary role now is to get the funding, you know, so I'm now I'm starting to, you know, write grants and we, we've gotten some big grants in the door. We've had some various, very generous donors. Uh, one donor in particular, you know, gave us hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of four years to run a program with court involved young people who also uh -huh. have low literacy scores. So uh, we have okay, yeah. Programs specifically for young young adults who are either incarcerated or on house arrest, um, who 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 cannot read, and we provide the reading intervention. So you know, there it's not just been it's been a it's been a, it's taken a village of people to make this thing happen and to to add their resources. Um, but for the most part, we generate our own revenue through our programming to then fund both the for profit programs and the non profit programs. Okay, and. Obviously now, six years later, seven years later, 
it's not you and your husband running out, out of the shop front five minutes from your house anymore. So what does it look like now? How's, how's it? You've obviously mentioned your role has changed within it, but, but if I walk to the door of Redwood, wherever it is now, or jumped on the website, what am I seeing now? Yeah. So Redwood is a community that houses, we all have the same mission. So our mission is to provide best in class, comprehensive intervention for students with dyslexia, any age. So we work with very young children all the way up to adults. Um, but the, so Redwood is the overarching umbrella. And then we have many programs underneath them. So we have a full day school program in Chicago for kindergarten through eighth grade. It's a specialized day school for students with dyslexia. If you are ever in Chicago and you're interested, you know, anyone listening, you're interested in, you know, us, what does a specialized school just built around the dyslexic brain look like? Go visit Redwood. It's a very cool place. Um, We have, like I mentioned, the community outreach program that's housed virtually. We have um, our own original curriculum. It's a a writing program for individuals with dyslexia, teaching them how to do basically the expository writing process. Um, And then really now the bulk of what we do Redwood wide, as well as what a lot of my time goes to and my husband's time goes to, is uh, growing our virtual programming because when COVID hit, we were not doing anything virtual before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, like everybody else, we yep. had to adapt. <laughs> um, and so we turned all of our programming online over a weekend. And as we, you know, kept moving through the pandemic, it, through that virtual platform, we saw that actually it was way cheaper to run. It allowed us to hire folks from all over the U.S. So it expanded both our student pool as well as our instructor pool. Significantly. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, we worked with many students in the UK. We had a uh, a partnership with a, a, a you know an international school in Scotland. So it opened up all of these opportunities that our in person programming you know would have never had the opportunity to to interact with, which is really cool. So because it's way cheaper to run and the results, we've worked with an independent researcher every year since our founding who looks at all of our results and says, here's where, you know, you're meeting your goals. Here's where you can get better. And we've, we saw one of the thing we, one of the things we looked at is, oh, is our, is our, our results decreasing or the effectiveness of our programming decreasing because we went virtual and we found that no, it stayed very steady. And if, again, if anything, we've been able to increase those results and, and are now outperforming through virtual instruction what we were able to do in person. Um, so because it's a more accessible model, that's really where we're putting our focus. And we, our favorite way, we work with private students but the bulk of what we do is focusing on working with schools where schools can hire us to provide virtual intervention during the school day at no cost to the students. So using state funding or federal funding to provide, you know, specialized dyslexia intervention uh, at no matter what school the child goes to, which that's really exciting to me. And that's really where our focus is for, for right now. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, it's like quite a few businesses, hasn't it? The shift online and being able to figure out online and be able to deliver the quality online has really helped businesses grow. One thing was interesting you mentioned about um, using your course within the prison population. Now, does it differ for them or is it the same course but maybe your teaching methodology was different for people in that kind of population? How does that compare to, say, going into a school? The methodology is identical in the sense of what we are teaching and the process in which we teach it. I would say that like, I I, I would say if anything, it's more just cultural awareness, right? Which again, if, you know, we're a US based company that all of our employees, I believe all are the majority of our employees are, you know, from the US originally. And so when we're working with a school in the UK, there's already that cultural difference to navigate. The school systems are different. The, you know, the learning diagnosis process is different. And so, or if we're working with a school in, you know, on the West side of Chicago, that maybe has a lot of poverty, a lot of violence, that's a part of that community, that's going to require, it's a different cultural lens. And so when Redwood, regardless of who we're working with, Redwood's job is to be experts in dyslexia and reading and writing, learning for individuals with dyslexia. And then it's our job when we partner with various schools and students 
to learn to, you know, what is important to you? What are you wanting out of this? What does your world look like? And so how do we make this instruction relevant to your life? How do we think outside the box and not just come to the table with like, this is our schedule for the day. We're going to do this, this, and this. But it's like, how are you guys doing? What's going on right now? And how, how, how is this reading lesson or this time together going to connect with your life in a way that's effective for you? I think that's what good teaching looks like, especially when, again, especially teaching neurodivergent learners where you know that you can't just assume you, I think we need to ask more questions there and really figure out what's going to work for you. How do we help you access this information that for whatever reason is a little bit more taxing on your brain to do? Um, so I think we back to the prison population. It's, you know, for many of them there, they have, they've just gone through or still are going through a lot of trauma. Um, and, and a lot of interrupted education. You know, I'm advocating for some students now who were incarcerated when they were teenagers and have not been provided any access to education, even though by law they should have that. So now you have, you know, a 13, you know, a young child who was incarcerated and then not given any education. And we have to give that education. Otherwise we can see what's going to happen, right? The, uh, it's estimated that 80% of the United States inmates are illiterate. And so our, and, and have learning disabilities. So the, the overlap is so clear and it makes logical sense. If any of us think about, yeah, what, what would it really be like to not be able to read in our society and how much harder life would be, especially if you don't have financial resources, all the things. So the methodology and the curriculum is the same, but I, you know, we really look for instructors for that program. And again, we try to not, again, not just for that program, but for our UK programs, we're trying to find instructors who are skilled at learning a new culture and asking good questions and being open-minded at the instruction, needing to change a little bit to connect with that student. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, isn't it? It all comes back down to the initial spark of the social economic diversity of everything, where it doesn't matter whether it's a school in the UK, a rough end of Chicago, affluent part of Chicago, or the prison populations to do with the environment that these people are in. And that's what you're trying to adjust your methodology to suit yes and what are the goals you know i think every student that we work with you know the academic intervention is never just purely academic you know when you're working with a student it's it's the whole student so figuring out what you know what what are your goals if you're in high school if you're 16 years old and you're just starting to get intervention now your goals might look differently than it, you know my daughter who's 7 starting this process yes, her goals of course. you know her goals look different and they do yes <laughs> really, really being responsive to who the student is and and what they want out of the process as well cool okay so i'm going to start winding the podcast up now and um every guest that comes on this podcast gets three rapid fire questions from me they don't need quick answers from you but they're quick questions from myself so Let's dive into question number one. What prejudice have you had about dyslexia that's been proven wrong? Well, I see, I still see with a lot of parents that I talk to, schools that I talk to, that it is often assumed that dyslexic learners are not as bright as non-dyslexic learners. They're yeah. not as smart. The word smart is used a lot. And I don't think, I, I think a lot of people don't say it directly anymore, but I think that prejudice is still subconsciously there. Like if, you know, if any of us, if we get an email filled with typos, there's a subconscious bias that someone who has a lot of typos is not intelligent. Yeah. And I have just seen that disproven over and over and over as I've spent the majority of the last decade hanging out and logging hours <laughs> with dyslexic individuals and they push my thinking all the time and they, <laughs> they help me see things I never would see with my brain wiring and so I think just I think my word to parents and educators and individuals who have dyslexia themselves is we have to actively push against this Sometimes unstated, sometimes stated, you know, reality that if you're dyslexic, you're not as smart or you can't accomplish as much or you're, or you're, you know, you're, you're not meant for school, whatever, whatever it may be. And, and really open our minds uh, to be challenged in that thinking and recognize, like, actually, if our school system isn't supporting a certain demographic of people very well, then maybe we need to change our system and, and make sure that we are, 
you know, responding to what we're seeing. Yes, yes. Okay, rapid fire question number two. If an alien landed and you had to describe dyslexia to them, how would you do it? Dyslexia is like seeing the world and experiencing life with more dimensions going on everywhere. And so having to put more effort into channeling your focus on on kind of one dimension at a time uh, and figuring out just how to navigate a world with that kind of brain that is built for very different types of brains. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a cool answer. All right. And the final question is rapid fire set and you're not allowed to use your own program for this. Um, seeing as this is the Dyslexia Life Act show, what is your favorite Dyslexia Life Act? Favorite dyslexia life hack. Mm. Well, the umbrella right now, the thing I'm really excited right now is assistive technology. I recently recently hired a director of assistive technology who's taught me so much. We have an assistive technology specialist on staff. And so anyone, anyone with dyslexia, no matter how old you are, and I just did this, my daughter's seven, I'm getting her a computer from school, I'm having the district teach her how to use all the tools that can help her read things out loud, have her own writing be turned into text. It is worth the effort to, even if you have to hire someone, like have someone who knows how to use assistive technology really well, show you as an individual with dyslexia how to make one light, one of your daily tasks take you less time. Um, I just think it's, I think it's so worth the effort, even though I know sometimes there's a real learning curve and anytime there's a learning curve that can feel daunting, but it's worth yeah. it. Yes, yes, definitely. We've have had various different assistive technology on this show and it's really interesting what's out there. It's cool. Yeah. So... Um, before we sign off, is there anything else you'd like to add and where can people find you? Um, people can find me at Redwood Literacy. So we're on Instagram, TikTok, all the places, LinkedIn. My email is kate, K-A-I-T, at redwoodliteracy.com. I love talking to people about dyslexia. I love helping folks get connected to the right resource. Uh, Redwood provides a lot of things. Uh, Redwood Literacy and Redwood Schools are the two official names of our organizations. You can Google us. And we also are just very well connected in this space, especially in the States. Uh, so if you are wanting to get connected to re you know resources in your city or area in the States, feel free to reach out to us. And if we can help, we'd love to, or we can help get you connected to someone who can. Cool. I'll put all of that in the show notes, obviously at dyslexialifehacks.com. And that leads me to thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me on the podcast. Ooh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. And I want to thank everybody else for taking the time to listen. And I'll speak to you in the next episode. Goodbye for now.